parametric equation and how you uh, define slope and related ideas in terms of a parameter. And then it goes, the chapter continues to talk about uh, polar coordinate representations as an example of uh, representing things with two parameters. And uh, <clears throat> so that's the general idea of what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, we have Cartesian coordinates. And the word Cartesian refers to Descartes, you see the C-A-R-T in Cartesian. And he gets credit, at least, for XY graphing and the idea of setting up an origin and uh, the two lines at right angles and the coordinates and so on. <clears throat> and so Cartesian coordinates are letters like X and Y if you're in a plane, or X, Y, and Z next semester if you're in three dimensions. Uh, when we write these Cartesian coordinates in terms of some other variable and then have a formula that uses this new variable, or it could be more than one new variable, um, then what you say is that these new variables, the new variable or the new variables, if it's plural, are parameters and you're selecting values of those and then by some formula computing the corresponding values of x and y or x, y, and z and then constructing your graph. So, for example, problem one in section 11, one, uh, we have x and y, the Cartesian coordinates, expressed in terms of a new variable that Book calls t. You can think of t as time if you want to. Uh, often, however, the parameter might be an angle, for instance, if you're thinking of polar coordinates. Notice that the 9t square is, is 3t, the quantity square, so another way to think of this is y equals x squared. So if you think of it that way, you expect to see something that looks like a parabola. The difference is that uh, you can, for example, restrict t, and <coughs> therefore, instead of having the entire parabola, which would go on forever, uh, you will have only a portion of it. Uh, for example, if you restricted t, as I've done here, between minus 1 and 1, then x would be between minus 3 and 3, and so you'd have that portion of the parabola where this would be minus 3 over here and 3 over here, and also, if you're writing or thinking of x in terms of t and y in terms of t, you have a sense of direction then, as t would vary in how you're tracing out this curve, and so you have a sense of motion, if you like, along the curve. For example, when t is negative, x is negative, and as t goes, say, from minus 1 through uh, values that are ever less negative, so t is increasing in the sense that it's less negative, uh, what, you're, what this implies is then that the x is moving along, as I'm pointing with the stick here, and you see my red arrows then, you're coming down along the curve from the left, you get to zero, then as t becomes positive, you're moving outward to the right. <coughs> so 
the parametric idea is important if you want to think of an object moving along and tracing out the path uh, as it goes. Another thing that's important, uh, another important concept, say, that um, you have with parametric representations is that you can have several different ways to represent something parametrically and the graph will be identical. Uh, for example, in problem 19, there are, they want you to show four different parameterizations that give the same graph, which is a circle, center at the origin and radius equals A. So here is my circle. And uh, CW is clockwise and CCW is counterclockwise. That's the official uh, abbreviations of the U.S. Air Force. I used to teach classes out of Mountain Hole, the Air Base. The Air Force has a two or three letter abbreviation for just absolutely everything. It's one thing I learned. And then they make verbs out of it. For example, PCS is permanent change of station in Air Force speak. So that it's transferring, of course. So then a guy will come and say, I'm PCSing. This is an English sub language. <laughs> well, anyhow. One turn clockwise, okay? Uh, a parameterization that'll do that is, remember the radius is A, A cosine T and minus A sine T, where T now is really like an angle, zero to two pi in radians. And you can check that this will take you around as my uh, red, arrows in here indicate. For example, uh, in my four parameterizations here, I'm always starting out here. And you see at time or angle zero, uh, cosine zero is one, so your x-coordinate is a. You're, if you're writing things with the brackets like this, as for example, you do if you're doing things with maple, uh, what you put here is X, and what you put here is Y, which I imagine you'd have guessed anyway. And then, after this comma, you give, you name your parameter, which is the T here, and you give whatever is its interval, such as 0 to 2, 5. And uh, so if T is 0, Cosine is 1, so you're at A for x, and sine of 0 is 0, so you're there. If t is pi over 2, cosine is 0, sine is 1, so x is 0, y is minus then a, a times minus 1. Um, so um, the the sine is 1, and then you use the minus here to put you down here instead of up there. And then at pi, cosine is minus 1, and sine is 0, so you're at minus 1, 0. And at 3 pi over 2, that would be 0, and the sine is minus 1, and then you have minus a minus, so you're up there so it takes you around. And in the same way, you can check out my other colors. So for two turns clockwise, you see I have the green kind of on top of the red. So the red is the first turn around, like this would be, and then the second turn would be the green. And uh, you'll get that on the second turn because you're going on to 4 pi. 
and if you wanted yet another turn, uh, you'd just take either uh, this one or this one, and you'd go on to six five and so on. So you can wind around and around and around, but the Cartesian graph is the same circle. So you can really dream up, if you're writing things parametrically, you can dream up all kinds of parameterizations that'll give you the same uh, Cartesian coordinate graph. So there is a difference, a distinction, if you will, in mathematics generally, and especially in a calculus class, between a function and its graph. Namely, the graph in here is the same circle. But these are all different uh, functions written or represented parametrically that have the same graph. So this becomes important if you're thinking of something like arc length because uh, these two, the uh, length of the curve, which would be the arc length of the graph, would be the uh, circumference of the circle. These two would be twice the circumference because you, if you're thinking of unwinding tape, you've wound the tape around twice with this one uh, compared to winding the tape around once with this one and so on. <clears throat> well, 11.2 deals with tangents to parameterized curves and then their second derivative for whether the curve is concave up or down, which is a way of saying you're studying uh, curvature. And uh, <clears throat> then finally, we get back to what I just mentioned here about arc length of the curve and surface area. So at any t then, the slope of the tangent line for a curve, uh, I'm using the letter m, which is related to the idea that often in algebra class, m is slope. Like for example, your slope y-intercept form of a line is y equals m times x plus b where m is slope and b is where the line crosses the y-axis. That's often what you see in books anyway. So I'm using m like that. But if you have a curve other than a line graph, the m is variable. And so I'm thinking of it now, since we're working with x and y in parametric form with t as some parameter, that slope also can be parametric. So I have m of t then, which is, of course, dy dx, because that your first derivative is always your slope. So thinking of it that you have um, x equals x and y in terms of t represented somehow, you could use the chain rule here and say that um, it is dy dt over dx dt because if you treated these as fractions, as differential quotients, the dt would cancel and you'd be back to here. So the chain rule allows us to compute uh, dy dx and then the derivative of that use for concave up and down when we know x and y in parametric form. So the dy dx is this quotient of the derivatives and then the second derivative which you use for uh, it's related to curvature 
it, the curvature is not just the second derivative, but they're related. And because they're related, the sign of the second derivative tells you about concave up and down. And uh, so that's the derivative, of course, of the first derivative. And so if the first derivative is this formula for slope, written parametrically, what you have here <coughs> is the derivative of this function of t taken with respect to x. Well, here again, the way you do that is chain rule because this is the dm dt over dx dt because again, if you cancel the dt, you'd have dm dx, which is what you're talking so let's do a problem here so you can see what I mean. So think of it that you have x as 2 cosine t and y as 2 sine t. And what problem 1 wants is various things at a specific value, t equals pi over 4. So the m is as I've said here by the chain rule, dy dt over dx dt, okay? dy dt is 2 cosine t. dx dt is minus 2 sine t. The 2's cancel, you can put the minus up here, and cosine over sine is cotangent. So your slope is minus cotangent. And this is a function, you see, of t, you've written parametrically. It gives you what you have now is a function here, expressed parametrically, that gives you x, one here that gives you y, and one over here that gives you the slope, all in terms of t. And uh, then, the curve, if you want to study curvature, you're talking about getting the second derivative. So that would be the derivative with x of your first derivative. So it would be the derivative <coughs> with x of this function here. So it would be the derivative of this with t. You see, that's the, the mvt over the derivative of x with t, which we already did, because here was x, and the dx dt was this right here. So your second derivative is really this thing, um, the derivative, rather. It's the derivative of this thing over um, this one over the minus 2 sine t. And the derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant square. So you get a minus here from the derivative formula. And you already have this minus because the m of t was minus cotangent. So those cancel to plus. And then you're dividing by the x dt, which again has a minus with it, because it's the derivative of the cosine. So you end up with a minus. Cosecant is 1 over sine, so you have 1 over 2 sine cubed. Count them 1 there and 2 more there. So then you can get your values at pi over because that's where they want the values. So your slope is minus cotangent, and cotangent of pi over 4 is the same as tangent, it's 1, so you get minus 1. The point on the curve, uh, they want the tangent line. If you have your book, and you, you can read what the problem wants. It wants the slope, it wants the equation of the tangent line, and it wants the value of the second derivative, which 
in turn would tell you whether it's concave up or concave down at that point. And uh, they, at this point, we haven't actually uh, seen the curvature formula itself, but you have the tools here to get that also if they did want it. Okay, so your slope is cotangent, which is minus one. So at pi over four, the point on the curve, you'd go back to where you have the x and the y. So you have two cosine pi over four and two sine pi over four. Well, you remember your sine and cosine is root two over two. So what you have is two times root two over two. The twos cancel. Same game here. So they're both pi, uh, x of pi over four and y of pi over four are both two cosine and two sine pi over four. So same answers both times. So root two, root two. So then you can get your tangent line because if you have a point on the curve, then y minus the y coordinate is the slope at that point, which we did, times x minus the x coordinate. And if you simplify this, you get down to x plus y equals 2 root 2. And then, finally, if you want your second derivative, as you know, we found the, we went through this, and we found that the formula is minus 1 over 2 sine cubed uh, for any value of the parameter where, where sine isn't 0. Of course, it's not defined if you're at a t where sine would be 0. And uh, so at the point in time, if you're thinking of t as time, pi over 4, your sine is root 2 over 2 again. So you put that in there in a few bit and simplify that down to minus root 2. So your second derivative is negative, And so that would correspond to what we call concave down. So for example, um, if you're thinking of going around a circle, and uh, you see this, this parameterization is, is um, like this one, one turn uh, counterclockwise. So you're about there at pi over 4. And certainly that is concave down, isn't it? Because the tangent is above the curve. That's what you mean by concave down. So it's what it ought to be. And you see, this would be the equation of the tangent line, which would be like stick this. OK, so there are in the homework in 11 too, there are various problems like this where you're to get the slope and then use the chain rule with the slope formula to get the second derivative and get the tangent line and so on. Then the problems 25 through 27 want arc length when you're curve is defined parametrically. And then problems 31 through 33 want you to think of taking the curve and rotating, as we did in chapter 6, around either the x-axis or the y-axis to form a surface of revolution. And then we're to get the surface area. So for example, um, if you look at 25, x is cosine t, and y is t plus sine t. <coughs> and so 
we get dx dt and dy dt without a great deal of trouble. And you remember that when you're talking about either arc length or surface area, you're thinking back to what we call the differential triangle between arc length, which is S, and the X and the Y that relates the differentials by the law of Pythagoras. So you're uh, replacing a portion of the curve by the corresponding hypotenuse of a right triangle, and you're saying that if you're, when your differentials are small enough, there isn't that much difference, and so you can set up your sum, your Riemann sum, using the hypotenuse line from the triangle, and either you get a sum that's too little or too much, and either way, if you uh, take the limiting sum as the number of um, little line segments becomes infinite and the length of each one approaches zero and you get a common limit whether you've set the triangles up with the on the inside where it's too small or on the outside where it's too large to get to the common limit that's what you call your uh, Riemann integral and get your arc length. So that's the same argument that you make with all of these applications. <clears throat> so anyway, the ds dt then would be the square root of the dx square, um, <clears throat> well, dx dt square plus dy dt square. So you're taking this and squaring it, and that gets you the sine square, and you're taking <clears throat> this one and squaring it, and that gets you one plus two cosine t plus cosine square. And then sine square plus cosine square is one, and this one makes two, and then you have the two cosine t there. And you can factor the two, if you like, like this. Now, there are two ways you can do the integral besides maple, of course, and uh, your graphic calculator and things like that. So I'll show you two ways you could work the integral that we're going to get to. You see, the arc length then is going to be root 2 times the integral of square root of 1 plus cosine t, as you see here. And they want the arc length from 0 to pi in the story. <coughs> so one way you can do this is to replace your 2 plus 2 cosine t with, after you factor the 2, you can replace your 1 plus cosine t with 2 cosine square of t over 2, half angle formula. So let's look in the recipe box and see about that. Your beginning of wisdom with these recipes that you use for this kind of integral is that the, from the trig class, the cosine of 2 theta is cosine square minus sine square. And then you use trig identities for sine square, which is, after all, um, well, as you know, sine square plus cosine square is 1, so it's 1 minus cosine square. So then you have cosine square minus quantity, 1 minus cosine square, so you get this. It, you can also replace the cosine square, and you can get this one. So cosine of 2 theta is either of these things. So then, 
take this one and solve for 2 cosine square by moving this across, and it's 1 plus cosine of twice the angle. And similarly, you can do that here for 2 sine square. Now, if you say that theta is half of some other angle t, you put um, t over 2 there to get to here, and 2 times t over 2 there to get to there. So that tells you that 1 plus cosine of t is 2 times cosine square of half t. So I can do that. Um, as I said here, and now what I have, if I'm uh, back to here, I have this 2, and then I have uh, the <coughs> um, the 1 plus cosine t replaced with 2 cosine squared of t over 2. So I have 4 cosine squared t over 2, square root of 4 is 2, and then the square root of cosine square is the absolute value. Well, between 0 and pi for t, your t over 2 goes between 0 and pi over 2, as I've written here, and your cosine between 0 and pi over 2 is positive. And so your absolute value is just the cosine itself. And then what you integrate, when you integrate the cosine, you get sine. So you integrate cosine of t over 2, you get sine of t over 2 over, uh, well, si it's sine of 1 half t, so you get that over the 1 half. So then you invert and multiply here, and you get 4, and sine of t over 2, when you put the pi in, you have sine of pi over 2, which is 1, so your arc plate is 4. So that, that's one way you can do the integral. The other way that you can do the integral is what I call method 2 here, and I'll show you that one in just a second. Remember, our objective is to do this integral here. So the problem is, what do you do with the 1 plus cosine t under the square root sign? The other thing you can do is work with an identity like this. This is certainly a true statement, because I'm multiplying and dividing by the same thing. And then I can take, and you notice that what I'm using here is the conjugate of what I started with. When you have something that you write with a sum or a difference of two terms, the conjugate is the same two terms with the opposite sign. So which is u to the half, or you can rewrite it like that. Add 1, so you get square root u on top, divide by the new exponent. And so this 2 is this one, this root 2 is that one, and then square root of this 2 is this one, and you get 4. So you can do this problem either of two ways by hand. You can do the, yes? Why have the second t equals um, pi and u, which is 1 minus cosine? Why is the second one u equals u instead of square? Well, at t equals pi, you have 1 minus cosine pi. OK. So we can write it up here. Okay, now cosine pi is minus 1. Um, 
we have 1 minus minus 1. Okay? So it's a little tricky, but you do get there. So you could do that problem either way, or of course you could ask Maple or a high-end graphing calculator. <clears throat> so the uh, problems 31 through 33 want us to <coughs> revolve a curve around the axis that it says in the problem, uh, either x-axis or y-axis, working with two parameters. What we've done so far has been one parameter, but you could have two, you could, in theory, you could have any number of parameters, but the, uh, using the polar coordinates as parameters gives you a two-parameter family, if you like. I have a handout for that. Doing polar coordinates, as I said, the uh, related, how they relate to where we've reached at this point in this chapter. They allow us to represent curves using the two parameters, R, and this is the Greek letter, theta. And we place the pole there of polar coordinates at the origin <coughs> of the XY system in order to use them uh, in an efficient way as a two-parameter system to represent x and y values. So then what you call the initial ray in polar coordinates, which would be like this in my picture, will coincide with the positive x-axis. And in measuring things out in polar coordinates, you start standing on the pole, facing in the direction of the initial <laughs> ray, <clears throat> and what you do first is to turn through the angle, and then what you do second is to walk by the amount that you give as r. And you see, when you have turned, you could walk forward the way you're facing, r is positive, or backward if r is negative. So that means that you could stand here, turn through an angle theta, and walk forward like the green arrows are pointing out to some point, or you could turn through another 180 degrees and then walk backward like the red. You see my backward pointing arrows. So, <clears throat> let me dance for you, okay? So, say my pole is here. If you can see, you see there's a change in the carpet, a change in the pattern. So, the line along that way where the carpet changes is the initial ray. So, I stand like this, okay? I can turn through 45 degrees and take, say, two steps forward and get to a point. I'd call that 2 comma pi over 4. Or I could do 45 degrees and another 180 and take two steps backward and I end up in the same place. So there are two fundamental systems or two independent families uh, <clears throat> that you can use to represent the same point. And it's more, there's more possibilities than that, you see, because you can also have all the periodic repeats you want. You can add 2 pi. 2k pi, where k is any integer. In other words, you can do something like this. Until you get to do the you fall down. I can stand here and I can turn my 45 degrees and 
plus 2 pi. Well, how many of these I should try, but you see the idea. So, in a sense, there are literally infinitely many ways you can represent a point with polar coordinates, but there are the two fundamentally different families, okay? So, uh, you can think of analogies with uh, current politics in this country, but uh, we don't want to go there. <laughs> At least I don't. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> At least not with any of the choices we have. So anyhow, um, we have a point out there. Fundamentally, it could be r theta or minus r, which means you're going to walk backward. And you see, it could either be theta plus pi, or it actually could just as well have been theta minus pi. And so, uh, as I'm saying here, having turned through the angle, I put absolute values there because the angle can be either positive or negative, uh, where positive is counterclockwise and negative is clockwise. Um, <clears throat> you walk a distance, which is the magnitude of r from the pole, and r positive, you walk forward, r negative, you walk backward. And then we can add the integer multiples of 2 pi. So r theta is the same as r theta plus 2k pi, where k is any integer. And the k can be negative, you see, so you can have um, theta minus 2 pi and stuff like that. And then the other, the alternative where you're going to walk backward is minus r theta plus pi, which is my picture there. It would, in general, be theta plus pi plus any multiples of 2 pi on top of that. And uh, you see, if you factor, that's theta plus 2k plus 1 times pi. k is any integer. 2k is even. 2k plus 1 is odd. So what it says is that you're adding odd multiples of pi. And so therefore, you can have minus r theta plus pi, where k is 0. Or if k were minus 1, you'd have minus r theta 1 minus 2 is minus pi. <clears throat> um, now, you can use right triangle trig to relate your coordinate systems. So here's my, in black is my x, y again. And I have the basic angle theta, say, and the r. And look at the point out here. It has coordinates x, y. I use the blue here just to suggest the distances x and y, and it also has the coordinates r theta, say. Well, if you look at this as a right triangle and use your right triangle trig, your x then would be r cosine theta and your y would be r sine theta. And so these are two parameters, r and theta, that you're using to represent the original Cartesian coordinates x and y. Just like all the stuff over there under the clock is one parameter t that you're using to represent x and y. And uh, if you square and add and use your trig identity, you can say this, and if you take the y over the x, your sine over cosine is tangent, and so you can get this. So if you have uh, the Cartesian coordinates x and y, you can get to what the corresponding polar 
coordinates would be for your basic representation. And if you have the polar coordinates, r and theta, you can certainly compute the x and y coordinates for any point. So you can go either way. So my thinking of this as parametric equations with these as the parameters, we have x of r theta and y of r theta, like that. So if you look at equivalent polar coordinates then, as meaning they define the same graph, I use this wiggle sign in my notes that I've prepared, which you have. Uh, you notice that what we have in my notes here is a kind of dictionary of curves that people commonly write in polar coordinates instead of uh, Cartesian coordinates. And the reason is that in polar coordinates these things are functions <coughs> and the curve written with x and y will not be functions. Well, that's important because to do integrals and derivatives, you have to be working with functions as a general statement. And so we can get the areas and arc lengths of these, of the figures that are defined by these curves using polar coordinates whereas you either couldn't do it if you rewrote the formula with x's and y's, or you'd find it very hard to do, at least. So that's what uh, uh, most of chapter 11 is about, really. And uh, <clears throat> so using this wiggle symbol in this way that it's the same graph, even though uh, you're not necessarily able to get from the one formula that I'm calling F to the other one that I'm calling G by trig identities or algebra. If they, they may still have the same graph. The reason is this business here, that you have two fundamentally different uh, ideas, if you want to say it that way, uh, that you're using to represent a point in polar coordinates, the greens or the reds, you see. And uh, <clears throat> so r equals f of theta is going to define some graph. Minus r equals the same functional form of theta plus pi, or minus r equals the same functional form of theta minus pi, they'll all give you the same graph because <clears throat> r theta, r minus r theta plus pi and minus r theta minus pi are the same point. So as I have already said, many graphs that are relations in xy form and therefore it's difficult or not even possible to do calculus with them, are functions in polar form, and they may be functions that are fairly easy to work with. <clears throat> One of the important things in uh, polar graphing is tangents at the pole. And to do that, you take what it, your polar coordinate formula, f of theta, and set that equal to zero and solve for theta. Now you did that if you took trig in say math 143 or math 147 or in high school, uh, you get to where you, there's a section always in the trig book on solving trigonometric equations. And uh, among them is trigonometric equations where you've got some uh, formula written in terms of trig functions equal to zero. To solve for all the angles, get, a, get formulas for them, or solve for all the angles that are between zero and two pi, or however they word the question. So you'll get some solutions 
uh, in many cases. Of course, there'll be some uh, formulas in terms of theta where there are no solutions, but often you'd get different solutions. Theta 1, which might be pi over uh, 3, say, or theta 2, which might be 2 pi over 3, and so on like that. So those will define tangents to the graph at the pole. And uh, then these tangent lines are what we call a ray. The definition of the word ray in polar coordinates, say you get a solution here, theta equals some value alpha, like pi over 3, say then the line that you draw from the pole at that angle with the initial ray uh, is what you call a ray. So it's kind of a half line from the pole that can go out to infinity if you don't stop it. And these will be tangents to some curve if the curve you had, f of theta, set equal to zero gave you these values. So we could look a little bit, uh, so you'll see what I mean. Uh, take the, the handout and uh, particularly turn to uh, what would be page four. So it would be the back side of the second sheet of paper in. And this is an example of doing uh, tangents at the pole. Um, these curves that look like flowers are defined either by r equals whatever constant you want that coefficient, the a, I'm looking at r equals a sine 3 theta, which is on page 4, the back side of the second sheet of paper. And the a will be the distance from the pole out to the extreme point on the petal, where I kind of have lines, well, for the top two petals, I have the line indicated with the dashes. In the third pedal, there's the negative y-axis. So those, the lengths of those lines would be the a. Okay, and then if you have a sine 3 theta, if you set sine 3 theta equal to 0 and solve as a trig equation, um, <clears throat> you see that I have done that. Um, I say tangents at theta 1 equals 0, then uh, the next solution to sine 3 theta is 0, is uh, 30, <coughs> uh, 30 degrees, or, or, no, it would be 60 degrees. Sine is 0 at 0 and at 180 degrees, so 180 degrees <coughs> over 3 is 60, so pi over 3. And you see I've indicated with the pi over 3 where you have a tangent. Then next would be um, 360 degrees. Divide by 3 is 120, so 2 pi over 3. And you see the tangent over there at the left. And then the next one would be <clears throat> the third of 540, which is the 180 degrees, and so on. So you get six different tangent lines, and then if you kept going with sine 3 theta, you'd be repeating your answers. And of course, you could do this until you died if you can't think of anything else to do for the rest of your life. So, <clears throat> you get the tangents to the pole for the graph in, in that way. And then halfway between the tangents, uh, when it's a symmetric figure like this, 
you get the center lines of those petals, which had the length A. Notice that if you have an odd multiple of theta, like the three theta, that's that coefficient is how many petals the flower has. If it's even, the other one on the page, where you have sine two theta, two times that coefficient is how many petals the flower has. So I have the sine three theta and sine two theta flowers on that page, and uh, I, <coughs> if you have cosine instead of sine, it'll be the same flower, but it'll be rotated. So the, the cosine ones are on the next page. Well, we'll pick up with polar coordinates and uh, these graphs uh, next week in the uh, section 11.3 and look at some of the problems in the book on uh, Thursday of 11.3 and 11.4. So everybody should have, either yesterday or today, received test three. If you got here and didn't get it, well, you get it at the end of class. Be sure you get test three. And other than that, I will see you uh, Thursday, if all goes well for all of us. <laughs>